Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for that prayer that the lessons learned <clears throat> would stick with us for our whole lives. That's what uh, Sam just prayed. So. Well, for those who don't know, we are following a short series on John's Gospel. This is the fourth of eight sessions. We're doing two a week, so a month or so should see us through those eight sessions, but uh, it certainly won't see us through John's Gospel because uh, this morning we actually move out of chapter one into chapter two. Towards the end of John's Gospel, in chapter 20, verse 30, John makes this statement. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So for whatever reason, but under divine guidance, John has chosen to select just seven of these miraculous signs. Clearly and rather tantalizingly, there were obviously many more. Uh, one can only speculate and wonder what the other signs might have been and how many there were, we don't know, but he has just chosen seven of them. And the first one of these miraculous signs that John records took place during a wedding or marriage celebration. And historically, I think just about every world religion is involved in or celebrates three particular events in the life of an individual. There's the celebration of a birth, there's the celebration of marriage, and a celebration or commemoration of death. In English, we sometimes reduce it to the little phrase, hatched, matched, and dispatched. But what is interesting is, of those three events, uh, birth, marriage, and death, the individual is only really aware of what is happening in the middle, the second of the three. A child is usually too young to understand or remember his or her dedication or christening or baptism or whatever particular phrase you use. And no one since creation, to my knowledge, has yet talked about their own funeral service. But when it comes to the wedding, well, that's different. That's a never-to-be-forgotten experience. Now, we're not told who was getting married but we are told uh, where it took place, in Cana of in Galilee. So let's read together uh, this first of the miraculous signs. It's found in John chapter 2, and it's the first 11 verses. And then we'll see what we can apply to ourselves today from this. So John, John 2, verses 1 to 11. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you saved the best till now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus reveal, revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. 
Well, as I said, we're not told who was getting married, but we do know where the wedding took place, in Cana in Galilee. Uh, it's very specific because there was more than one Cana, so that the place can be accurately identified It's Cana in Galilee, which is about halfway between um, the Mediterranean Sea uh, and the Sea of Galilee. You'll find it on a, a Bible map. And Jesus, interestingly enough, also performed his second uh, miracle there. In John 4 verse 46 it says, Once more he visited Cana in Galilee where he had turned the water into wine. So the second miracle took place in the same location. And that miracle was where he, he healed the very sick son of a royal official. But this first miracle is, as I guess, pretty well known. It's a easy to follow domestic story. It's not complicated. But the presence of Jesus at a wedding and what subsequently happens does raise some very important and interesting issues. Now, the first thing we're told here is that Jesus' mother was there. Why was she there? Was she related to one of the two being married or was she a friend or maybe a neighbor of the couple? Uh, we don't know. What we do know is that, as well as Mary, Jesus and the disciples were there because they'd been specifically invited to be guests at this party. And then, when we read, and his disciples, I guess, at this early stage, there were probably less than half a dozen, because if you read up to the beginning of John 2, you've just got the call of the, of the first disciples, so Peter and James... Uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John and Philip, maybe just those five or maybe six. Well, weddings are celebrated differently in different parts of the world. And in those days, feasting and celebrations following a marriage ceremony would have lasted anything, I would think, from five days to maybe even more than a week. Not like back in the West, where it's a couple of hours on a Saturday afternoon and evening, uh, this would have been a, a much longer uh, feast. <clears throat> and the presence of Jesus at this wedding indicates that Jesus honours and esteems marriage. Marriage is not just some tradition that's grown up in the West. It's a biblical ordinance with biblical precedent. And I think that really needs stating today, especially uh, for those of us who come from societies where marriage is actually less and less common. Um, Jesus' first miracle takes place at a marriage feast, a celebration of joining together of a man and a woman. And who better to invite to a wedding than Jesus? Who better to invite into your marriage than the saviour of the world? to give it spiritual stability and to give it a shared focus. Marriage was not and is not a human invention. Marriage was not our idea, it was God's. Words such as marry and marriage actually occur 150 times in the Bible, including 50 references alone to bride and bridegroom. The Bible actually is full of weddings and marriages from beginning to end, literally from Genesis to Revelation, from the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah in Genesis to the wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation. John Stott defines marriage like this. He says it's a publicly pledged, permanent, exclusive, heterosexual union. It's not a human, but a divine institution, which therefore in itself is not affected by a changing culture. But the sanctity of marriage is under threat. Since today, especially again, I think in the West, my part of the world that I come from, but also I see this, this influence spreading beyond there, marriage is neither or should neither be entered into lightly. Um, some choose not to enter it at all and others completely ignore it. So in the UK, for instance, you're much more likely to hear the word partner these days than you are to hear the word spouse or husband and wife. 
statistics show that rates of cohabitation, that's living together, are rising and the number of marriages consequently are falling. But marriage is a public declaration of commitment. It's, it's declaring it before God. You're also declaring it before people. It's a, a public commitment of a change of status. It informs people where you now stand. And that's important. Uh, my niece uh, lived for, I think, about five years uh, with a guy. She's actually now moved on to, to somebody else. And uh, during that five years, my, my mother ha had quite a problem, <clears throat> especially when it came to Christmas. Uh, in the tradition of sending Christmas cards, she said, you know, I, I really don't know what to do. Should I send, uh, you know, my, um, my granddaughter and her boyfriend, should I send them one card? Because if I do that, then I'm identifying them as a couple and myself sort of as like, uh, you know, a, a grandmother in that situation, or so, should I send them individual cards? And she was in a, a dilemma. She didn't know what the situation actually was. There'd been no public, clear statement. That's just one of the negative spin-offs uh, when you have a, a sort of a, a relationship without any real long-term commitment. Um, the, the Prime Minister of England... Uh, is David Cameron, probably most of you would know that, but the leader of the opposition uh, is a guy called Ed Miliband. Um, and he was interviewed on the BBC shortly before the last election. And it was a phone-in programme, so they were inviting people to call in. And Ed Miliband at that stage had had a long-term relationship with a woman to which he wasn't married. And I was listening to this this uh, phone in and a woman came on the line she said why are you afraid to commit yourself to this woman and what message do you think that gives to your supporters and it completely threw him he really didn't know how to answer it uh, since then interestingly enough uh, he's he's got married uh, to this woman but uh, it it does present some some issues um, a recent news item stated in Britain that there are now more cohabiting couples than married couples. And before cohabitation became common, it used to be referred to as living in sin, which, although that uses biblical language, isn't really a description of that arrangement that's found in the Bible. But that's how it was viewed, going back not so many years. To cohabit means to live together as husband and wife without actually being married. And as I said, this has become an increasingly popular lifestyle in the West. In the UK, over three quarters of couples who were married back in uh, 2001 in the UK had first lived together. Dr. Alan Cairns, speaking on this passage, said this, True religion never flourishes where the marriage tie is lightly esteemed, easily made, easily dissolved, and the legal contract means nothing. Inviting Jesus into a marriage is certain to strengthen it. For Christ himself is the bridegroom who's come for his bride, the church. So this event shows that Jesus cares about, not just about marriage, but I think about the joyful occasions of life. And he wants us to share them with him. He's not some antisocial killjoy despite the way sometimes Christians are, are portrayed in, in the media and elsewhere. In Matthew's Gospel, we read that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And the coming age which the Messiah would herald was sometimes likened to a joyful wedding feast. So here we have a wedding, a marriage, into which, to which Jesus Christ and his disciples have been invited. Well, weddings take a lot of organising. Anybody who's been involved will know this. And one area that always needs careful planning is the catering. Now, I doubt in those days whether any official invitations would have been sent out, since basically all the extended family, as well as probably all the local community, would have been automatically invited. That's how it operated in those days. That's how the culture worked, which to my mind, must have made planning food and drink a particular challenge 
If you don't know exactly how many are coming, how much do you have to prepare? Well, there suddenly arises a major problem in this marriage feast. The unthinkable happens. The wine runs out. Can you imagine what a massive embarrassment that would mean and potentially could make any mention of that particular marriage for years to come a subject of ridicule and probably gossip long after the wedding had taken place. So suddenly there's a crisis in the catering arrangements uh, that's completely unacceptable. So what to do? Well, it's Mary who speaks up. Mary, the mother of Jesus, brings the need to her son. All she does is she looks to Jesus and says, they have no more wine. Now, Mary knew Jesus better than anyone else. It had only been probably what, 10 miles away or 16 kilometers away, 30 years earlier, that she had experienced an unforgettable visitation by the angel Gabriel. And ever since then, she'd been watching and thinking. And Luke tells us that she was treasuring up all these things and pondering them in her heart. Here was the one who carried and born the Son of God. The Messiah who'd been promised through the ages. And maybe now she felt that this was the time for him to declare and publicly demonstrate his messiahship. Now was the moment, maybe she felt, for him to take centre stage and to reveal his true identity. So she turns to him and she says, they have no more wine. She saw the need, but she immediately knew who to turn to. I mean, she could have gone to the servants, those who were responsible for bringing the food in and out. She could have gone to the master, uh, the governor of the feast, and said, hey, you're the one in charge of the organisation, they've run out of wine. She could have gone to the bridegroom, which uh, would have been a possibility, or, or even to the disciples, but she didn't. All of those probably would have tried to respond in some way. No, she went just, only, straight to Jesus. And she told him. What did she tell him? She said, well, here's the need and I'm bringing it to you. They have no more wine. She doesn't suggest the solution. She doesn't sort of hint how this problem could be sorted out. She simply went to him and stated the situation as it was. And for me, this is an outstanding example of how we need to approach Jesus. Our role, our task, our privilege is to bring the need to Jesus. And that's it. And, and not be tempted to also suggest solutions or answers to that need. It's the Lord. For him to bring the solution in his way and in his time. Haven't you often felt that temptation? You know, you come with a need, but you also come with your own little answer to how that need is going to be met. And you might even, in your prayer, suggest to Jesus, you know, do you mind if I just share with you how you might like to answer my prayer? No. Just bring the need. That's our task. So what needs might we bring today? to Jesus as a ship's company. She said, they have no more wine. What do we say? I think we say, Lord, we have no long-term chief engineers. I think we say, Lord, we have no money or sufficient money to cover the dry dock and then the following year, the power up project. Just bring the need. Maybe as individuals we might say, Lord, I have no idea what I'm going to do when I go home. Lord, I don't know what my future is. Prayer is about presenting needs, not offering solutions. And we should resist the temptation of, of suggesting solutions. Just bring the need, leave it with him. We pray, 
God works. They have no more wine. Well, Jesus' reaction to this, judging by our standards, might seem a, a little bit harsh or even rude. He says, dear woman, this is an NIV translation, dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Dear woman, you, you could actually translate that as my dear. I think the authorised version just says woman, which is a bit stark and almost uh, rude. No, dear woman, it's, it's a term of, of love and respect. Jesus addresses his mother in exactly the same way, with the same word, when he is uh, dying on the cross. Do you remember, speaking of John, he said, Dear woman, here is your son. So it's not, it's not rude, but at the same time, I think we need to realise this isn't any son talking to his mother. This is the saviour of the world talking to a follower or a believer. Maybe actually the saviour of the world talking to the very, his very first follower and believer. Dear woman, why do you involve me? It's very interesting. In the original, it, it, it translates a little bit strangely. It says, what to me and to you? In other words, it's as though there's a difference of outlook and understanding in, in who, who Jesus is and why he has come. A difference in understanding the timing and, and the purpose of all this. Their, their concerns are not really the same. My time, in the original it says, my hour has not yet come. There was an hour that was to come. This hour was going to change the world. This was the hour for which he was born. Calvary was coming, but it was not yet. You can't force or preempt divine timing. I mean, these are early days. This is the first of seven signs. This is the, the beginning, if you like, of the, of the journey of Jesus Christ and people understanding who he is. This is the start. There's more revelation to come, more truth. That is not right now for him to reveal everything. And, and Mary sort of, like I guess many mothers do with their sons, wants to, wants to push him forward a little so that everybody can see who he is. And there's always a danger in, in haste. Uh, I think rushing can often be a trap of the enemy. If you're going into something new or, or you're not sure whether you should, rushing into it can often be a mistake. And of course this whole situation has arisen because of a lack of wine. This is the problem here, okay. We're, we're talking about a marriage feast, the wine has run out. And am I drawing too much from this when I, I see that wine would be the very thing that Jesus would later take as a symbol or an emblem of his blood. Wine, towards the end of his time, is going to take on a whole new significance. Why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. It's not a denial, maybe it's a mild rebuke. The right timing of the manifestation of his glory was crucial. It's interesting, later in John's Gospel, after Jesus had declared, this is in chapter 14, after he declares, I am the way, the truth and the life, he says this, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So this miracle was to be the first of a series of public displays of his glory. Verse 11 says exactly that. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus re revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. So Mary then says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. I mean, this story is full of timeless, priceless phrases. Do whatever he tells you. What superb advice. How will this need be met? 
How will this embarrassing situation be sorted out? Do whatever he tells you. The way your needs can be met is simply found in obedience to the Lord Jesus. He's got the answer. Take it to him, leave it with him, and then do whatever he tells you. If you hear his voice, do what he says. Her total confidence was in the saviour. I mean, I don't think she had any clue what he was going to do or, or how this situation would be resolved. She just knew that he was the answer. He was the one who could supply this need. He would do it in his way. And she was prepared to go public. I mean, in front of all the others there, she says, do whatever he tells you. Public at a very tricky moment in an important celebration with a great crowd of people. That's faith. And in terms of ministry, I have to say for me, this has become a significant verse. I mean, when I became a Christian, it was right at the start of three years of training at college that I was committed to. So it was clear where my life was going for the next three years at least. But how was I going to find out what gifts I had? How how do you find out what your gifts are? I mean, I guess you could go to a a seminar on spiritual gifts, probably cost you $100, get a nice lunch and a file to take away with you afterwards. It's one way of doing it, I suppose. I hadn't got the money or the desire to do that, but I still wanted to know what my gifts were. So I made a promise to God, almost immediately after I became a Christian. And my promise was something like this. If anyone asks me to do anything in Christian ministry, give me the courage never to say no. And that began a very interesting journey. Because I was often totally out of my depth, usually fearful and generally apprehensive. But I was determined to find out, you know, what were my gifts? How was I going to serve God with my life? Sure, I was going to be a primary school teacher. That was great, and it was great. But how was God going to use me? So I sort of opened myself up. And I guess over the years, I've just about tried every sort of Christian ministry there is. Some have gone well. Some have been disastrous failures. Do whatever he tells you. And you'll discover sooner or later where your gifts are. This is the great thing about this ship, isn't it? Endless opportunities. I said to God, if anybody asks me to do anything for you, help me never to say no. Do whatever he tells you. And then see where he'll lead you next. So what happens next? Well, standing nearby, there are six empty jars each with a capacity of 20 to 30 gallons, which is, I think, about 100 litres. These are stone jars. They must have weighed a ton. I mean, virtually immovable, especially full of water. And they weren't used for drinking from. These were for washing your hands, <coughs> ceremonial washing. This is, do you remember the disciples and Jesus got in trouble once because they hadn't washed their hands according to the rules of uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. It was all ideas about how to let the water trickle down your arm and each finger and all the rest of it. But six stone jars, each uh, with 100 litres, this is an impressive amount of H2O. Now, I don't know if there's any water in the jars already. Presuming they were empty, this was going to take quite a while to complete because each one had to be filled to the brim, do you notice? But with Jesus, no crisis is too challenging. No difficulty is too daunting. No situations beyond redemption. So having filled them to the brim, Jesus commands, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. <clears throat> so that's what they did. They drew it out. They took it to the master of the banquet. Now, the master of the banquet in those days was the one who was employed or asked or appointed to oversee all the practical arrangements. He would be the one directing the servants He would be the one liaising before the wedding with the bridegroom. And he would be in charge of all food, all drink and all entertainment. So it's quite a major role, really. But by the time the water reached the lips of the master, it had become wine. 
So in those few seconds, it was drawn off as water. By the time he tastes it, it is wine. How was that done? There'd been no prayer at all. There'd been no prayer for the water. There'd be no prayer over the jars. Jesus never spoke to the water. Jesus didn't say anything about the water. He didn't touch the water. He didn't touch anybody else. Without the use of any means whatsoever, he simply gave an order. The servants filled the six large jars. And as it was drawn out, somehow between the drawing out and the reaching of his lips, it had become wine. In fact, he declared it was the best wine. He was surprised. He was surprised when he tasted it because he said, well, usually what happens is you have the best wine first. And then as they progressively uh, become inebriated with the drink, then you, uh, you know, bring out less good wine. But this is the reverse. We're, we're, we're at the end here and you've saved the best till now. You know, there are some traditions of the church that believe in a thing called transubstantiation. I don't know if you have heard that word. Transubstantiation is the belief that at Holy Communion, when the priest consecrates the bread and the wine, the bread changes actually to the flesh of Jesus Christ, literally, and the wine changes to the blood. It's part of the, of the Roman Catholic uh, doctrine, doctrines um, it says in their statement of faith by the consecration of the bread and wine there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood this change has fittingly and properly been called transubstantiation so transubstantiation is when one substance miraculously becomes another. For me, this miracle at Cana in Galilee is a true example of transubstantiation. Water is turned into wine. And it happens simply by an act of the will, the imperial will of Jesus Christ. That's why it's such enormous significance. The significance isn't in the act itself, but it's in the one who was able to do this. Remember, John says this is a sign. He uses that word more than once, a miraculous sign. What is a sign? A sign indicates the direction. It, 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 it takes you from the sign itself to the one who's performing the sign. It points to something or somebody else. So you don't go and gaze at a sign and say, oh, how wonderful. You look beyond the sign to what is being indicated, to what is being shown. That's why it's a sign. Who can change one substance into another and why should he do it? What does this tell you about the one who is performing this miracle? Now, while there are obvious pragmatic reasons for this miracle. It was done to ensure continuous flow of drink. It was done to ensure that the governor didn't lose face in a very dramatic way. The servants probably themselves could have just gone and done some shopping and brought some more wine. But the fundamental reason Jesus did this was that he could start to reveal his glory, his true identity. In Colossians 1, it says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. All things were created by him and for him. This is a true miracle. No doubt about it. This is how it was described by John, a miraculous sign. And this particular miraculous sign not only revealed the glory of Jesus, but also, it says, his disciples put their faith in him. So their own spiritual lives, they'd been called to Jesus, they were following him, but immediately they're being deepened and informed and their relationship with Jesus is growing closer. I fear that some of us use the word miracle wrongly <clears throat> to describe events that are not in themselves miraculous. What do we mean by the word miracle? 
If somebody, for instance, I don't know, is uh, doing some exams and they pass the exams, you say, oh, that's a miracle. Really? If someone's been ill and you've been praying for them and they feel better, you say, that's a miracle. I don't really think they are miracles. I think probably they're better described as answers to prayer or examples of divine providence. A miracle is something which generally bypasses natural law and for which there's no rational explanation. So, when the man of God made the iron axe head float in the water, you can read that in 2 Kings chapter 6, that is a miracle. When you can comfortably feed thousands of people with just five loaves and two fish, that's a miracle. When someone who's been dead for three days, to the point that there's a smell because of bodily decomposition, that person is raised back to life, that is a miracle. And when we realise the nature of this particular miracle in Cana of Galilee, the truth is even more wonderful, because think about it, what was this miracle? Wasn't it an act of creation? Water? becoming instantly wine. Jesus took water. Well, he didn't take it, he just spoke. And it changed from being water and became wine. And you see, now we're getting to the whole heart of this, the reason for this event. This was a supernaturally creative act. And only one person, only one person has the ability to create in that way. And that's God himself. And in this act of instantly changing water into wine, we see again that great theme that John constantly emphasizes. We see the deity of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth we find here. Because Jesus Christ is seen and declared as God eternal in the flesh. Those who've been with me through the previous Sessions on John's Gospel will have heard a number of times the third verse of the first chapter. Through him, Jesus Christ, all things were made and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that light, life was the light of men. So we see in this simple miracle, apart from learning a number of lessons, Jesus is not primarily a teacher or a preacher or a leader, or a prophet, or even a miracle worker. He is the incarnate Son of God, who came into the world, born as a baby. So why did John record this miracle? Well, I'm sure you can give me the answer. These things are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for many lessons that we can learn from your word. And as was prayed at the start, we ask you to help us to apply these to our lives in these days. Thank you so much that you've revealed your glory, not just 2,000 years ago, but to us here this morning. Thank you that we can trust you. Thank you we can just bring our need to you. We don't need to bring all our suggested, suggested solutions We can just come to you as we are, confident that you are the one who will work all things out in your time and in your way for your glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.